Good evening, everyone. I'd like to share with you this evening uh, what I like to call audience-friendly poetry. A snowy day before Christmas one year, I saw a street person approach an elderly woman looking for a handout, uh, which she couldn't give. And from that observation came the poem I'd like to share with you now. And it's called A Christmas Gift. It's Christmas Eve with the sun going down on a snow-covered street in a small coastal town. Most town folk had gone to family and home. Just a few souls remained where many had roamed. The shop lights were shut off and the late shop is done and off in the distance Christmas carols were sung. The shawled old woman looked bent and gray as she slowly stepped along her way. This special Christmas Eve meant little to her, having outlived friends and those she held dear. <clears throat> the north wind was still blowing the snow in the air, and the step she took was with caution and care. As she neared the corner along the icy walk, a street person stopped by her side to talk. He had begged for many on that December day and was about to leave when she came his way. People gave easier at Christmas, they say. So he told his tale of woe in his usual way. And when finishing his plea what on luck was about, he leaned toward her closer and put his hand out. For empty pockets, she could not take the coin he hoped his coin would make. So she gave him a smile while her head she shook. And seeing her plight, back his hand he took. Now the wet snow was piling and he wished her no harm. With his waist bending slightly, he gave her his arm. Across the snow-covered road, his help he gave, and then they parted with a nod and a wave. Thank you, son. Merry Christmas to you. And he looked back. Merry Christmas to you, too. She had nothing to give but an age-worn smile. He had nothing to give but his arm for a while. Christmas reminds us, as long as we live, blessed with plenty or not, we always have something to give. Uh, before we leave the season of gifts, uh, the next poem I want to share with you is titled A Gift of Fruitcake. Now, it's said that there's only one fruitcake in the world and it's passed around from person to person. Well, the, the fruitcake in this poem is not that fruitcake. From the warm kitchen of my friend B, a gift of fruitcake was given to me. Now, a fruitcake buyer I've never been, a fruitcake taster, yes, now and then. Beneath its rum-soaked cover, the cake I sought, drew a slice and thought, what makes this the best of all the rest is that special ingredient, thoughtfulness. With all the downpours we've been having lately, I was mighty happy I had an umbrella in my car. Now, let me, let me tell you about my old umbrella. My old umbrella's virtues sing from winter sleet to showery spring, patiently standing in the front hall, waiting for a hot summer rain or a cool stormy fall. One wild wet day while walking about, an old nor'easter blew him inside out, and a look of sadness filled his eyes when he lost his job of keeping me dry. For he was always happy to spread his shrouded ribs above my head. So I carefully folded his arms once more and returned him home to a stand by the door. 
I was doing a reading at the old borders uh, on, in Peabody on Route 114, and the gentleman filming the event uh, was having an awful time with allergies. His eyes were watery, his nose was running, he was sneezing. And I went home that night and I wrote the next poem uh, titled Ragweed. Oh, it's a beautiful day, the people say as they pass upon the street. The sky is clear, no rain is near, and the air is free from heat. But the ragweed's in, and my poor chin is tired from hurling a sneeze. My head has a drummer, my nose needs a plumber. Misery coming to me on a breeze. It's hard to say it's a beautiful day when looking through watery eyes. <clears throat> Through sniffles, I pray for that glorious day, the day when the ragweed dies. A short distance from my old shop was a school bus stop where the youngsters uh, were waiting for the bus to go to school. They had a game they played. They would toss the coins on the ground and watch and laugh and get a kick out of watching the, the old folks bend over and pick up the coins. And the next uh, poem I want to share with you is titled, The Game. The youngster would toss the coins to the ground, then laugh as the old folks bent down and put the pocket for a rainy day the coins the youngster would throw away. The scene was repeated time and time again. The youngster would toss and the old man would bend. The youngster's contemptuous game would return to haunt his life and the ears would see him beg and steal and welcome the widow's might. One day he ventured back to the place from which he came and chanced to meet upon the street the old man who played his game. The young man had neither coins to toss nor laughter left to mock, but approached the old man, put out his hand, and help for his lot he sought. Through dimmed eye and mind, he remembered the brass young man, drew from his pocket a bag of coins, and placed it in his outstretched hand. The old man took pity on the young man that day, and gave back to him the coins he threw away. One day uh, in my office, an elderly woman came in carrying a saw. And she didn't look like a carpenter, so I asked her about the saw. And she said she played it in vaudeville years ago. And she also played on the Ted Mac Amateur Hour. So out of that uh, conversation and meeting, I wrote An Old Woman and Her Saw, which I want to share with you now. I was young and sitting in the balcony when the old woman bent the saw neath her knee and played a tune to the gathered throng as sweet as any thrush's song. I'm older now, but remember the nights when the old woman and her saw played under the lights. Years on the circuit brought neither money nor fame, but the joy they gave to many remain. Vaudeville passed by, and the old woman to the old trunk she went to see her saw, and he jeep leaped for joy, thinking his steel would once again sing but all she could think of was the price he might bring. It was then that we met at the door of my shop and hearing of her needs, the old saw I bought. Retired, he still hangs where I placed him that day and reminds me of the old woman and the times they played. The next very short poem is something I know you all can uh, relate to. The Equation. I've often heard it said by some 
We work eight hours, we sleep eight hours, and we have eight hours for fun. If this be so, I'd like to know why half my life I spend pulling at and searching for a plastic bag's open end. When I do a reading, I sometimes ask the audience, uh, uh, those who have a pet and think they dream when they're asleep, uh, raise your hand. Well, the affirmative hands went flying up. And so I shared with them uh, a cat's dream. It's about a cat, and his name is Mulligan. And he had a dream. Mulligan purred himself to sleep in the shade of that old apple tree, dreaming of another time and place, and a Bengal tiger was he. He saw himself prowling through India's bush and plain, watching the monkey soar when neath their trees he came. He was a mighty king and captured a cautious eye when all those he stalked or chose to pass on by. He was a mighty hunter, ruling the jungle land, fearing not a single thing except the flashing gun of man. It was from such a blast that he awoke, and realizing it missed its mark, he shook his head and stretched his back and darted towards the park. Still thinking of his reign as king and running as in his dream, he never saw the coming car, nor heard its tires scream. Mulligan now rests under the shade of that old apple tree, and I still can see him when he thought a Bengal tiger was he. Perhaps you could explain to me a, a phenomenon I often see. When driving through a city or town where road crosses and jaywalkers abound, this is the question I ask. When you stop your car to let them pass, why do the young with bodies strong and sneaked feet take so long to cross the street? And haven't the strength the good God gave to raise a hand in a thank you wave? But the old, who are bent and gray, rustle and run to get out of your way, and raise a thank you cane, or give you a nod. Now isn't that odd? Uh, the next poem is titled, The Old Iron Fence. Now I'm sure uh, when you were a youngster, maybe an oldster, uh, you took a stick to a picket fence and listen to it clickety-clack. The Old Iron Fence. There's a red brick church in the center of our town with an old iron fence that goes circling round. And Tom and I would stick it with a clickety-clickety-clack whenever we pass by it. Then again, on our way back, we'd shatter the morning quiet of a warm summer day, raising the pastor's dog to barking and driving the feeding birds away. But that was long ago, when Tom and I were young, and the old iron fence still stands where Tom's funeral mass was sung. How I wish that I could bring those golden mornings back when Tom and I would stick it with a clickety, clickety clack. Every year when St. Patty's Day comes, I have to pull out the one and only Irish poem I have in my book. And it's titled An Irishman's Dream. On St. Patty's Eve, I had a dream. 
Tomorrow all the world would turn green, and all the ladies would wear a bright green shamrock in their hair, and all the gents cabbage fed would wear a tam atop their head, and the children would dance and play with leprechauns throughout the day. The churches would echo with blessings and prayer, and Erango bra flags would hang everywhere. The pubs and halls would shake with song, and all would be wishing the top of the morn. In the hands of the dream angels, my wish I lay, and pray they grant it for just one day. As something you saw years ago on every rooftop was an antenna. And now they're just about all gone with cable in. But there's one rooftop that still has an antenna on it, and that's Pa's antenna. Well, the year cable came to town, Ma asked Pa to take the old TV antenna down. It wasn't just a signal catcher to him. It was a tree with many aluminum limb. He'd sit in his old wicker chair and watch his feathered friends gather there. They'd perch on arms old and bent, and Pa would listen to the calls they sent. He'd rather watch what his tenor brought than sit and see the picture it caught. Come what may, for Pa, the antenna must stay. So Pa told Ma she'd have nothing at all if a storm should blow and the cable fall. So Pa's antenna stayed on the chimney top, and he was right happy for all it begot. To all you parents out there with children, I'm sure you can uh, uh, understand this poem. Uh, reflections. You can sit by a fire on a cold winter night, or lie in the sun when the weather's right. You can warm your hands where the wood stove glows, or don a cozy coat when the west wind blows. But no greater warmth will you come to know than that which comes from watching your little child grow. What you cannot do, although at times you try, is to keep those young years from passing on by. As we get closer to fall, uh, we'll, you'll notice the, uh, the monarch butterflies herding up to take their long journey in the southwest part of the country. And the next poem I want to share with you is titled, Little Travelers. I went down to the grove, a shady spot to find, and hung my canvas hammock between the maple and the pine. I lay there swaying in a light summer breeze, watching the monarchs passing by the windows in the trees. On their yearly journey along a southwest track, fluttering little travelers dressed in orange and black. I drifted off to sleep, <clears throat> counting hardy butterflies instead of leaping sheep. I forgot my friend's birthday one time, and uh, I didn't get him a card, so I wrote a little poem for him. I was a day late, and it's titled A Birthday Wish. Your birthday's one day gone. Still, I'd like to send this wish along. May your life be refreshed as the rebirth in spring and feel the comfort in some of the cool breezes bring. 
May your autumn have colors varied and bright, and your heart feel the warmth of a fire on a cold winter night. If day or wishes leave you perplexed, think of these as early for the next. Excuse me. Just one minute. Ah, uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, let's go down to the beach for a while. The next poem I want to share with you is titled The Wish. A short distance from my beach house door, the surf seized a bottle and tossed it on the shore. Old dog Ziggy and I on our daily walk, hearing the morning talk, I saw the sunlit bottle with a rolled up note inside and wondered what was sent on the early morning tide. I picked up the bottle sunken in the sand and read its cryptic note trembling in my hand. Whoever finds this bottle, one wish be granted thee. I thought about the wish and how good my life had been and said to myself, what more could a granted wish lend? So I rolled up the note and placed it back inside and threw the bottle back to the outgoing tide. My Day at the Beach I laid my blanket down, unfolded my chair, and put my umbrella up in the soft sand. I went down to the water's edge where the wading sandpipers ran. And suddenly the sky grew dark and a gusty wind began to blow. Returning back, I found my chair down. And where did my umbrella go? I saw it sailing out to sea like a Viking ship far beyond my reach. The rain started coming in. So much for my day at the beach. As a locksmith uh, shop in Lynn, the fellow's now retired. And uh, he always said to me, you know, Ray, you never, you never do a poem about a locksmith. So I wrote him this poem. A Locksmith's Lament. I just turned in, my shoelaces were untied. When a call came from Miss Mary, who locked her car keys inside. With toolbox in hand, I left. And arriving in the cold night air, I saw in the moonlight Miss Mary standing there. It brought back to mind the year before when we first met at my key lock door. I made her a key and felt the love bug bite, verifying the truth of love at first sight. We spoke as I worked on her car door lock about this, about that, another small talk. Soon I would be through. Uh, and once more, hoping to find the key to her heart. Spring's Sweet Song. See if you can think what the sweet song is, if you know what it is. The old man left the barn at dawn and, and took his auger and pail along. He tramped across the springtime snow out to where the sugar maples grow. He bore a hole in the sapwood's mark and drove a spite through the maple's bark 
And then on a hook, his tail he hung, and the sweet song of spring begun. You know what the sweet song of spring was? It was the maple syrup drip, drip, dripping into the tin. Charlie's Deli. Charlie's Deli lies in the center of town. It's not just a place to eat, but where friendliness is found and daily acquaintances chance to meet. Though not on the menu, the weather's regularly served up and you get a tale or two while the waitress tops your cup. You get the latest news in town served to you on the side. A place where smiles abound and goodwill and warmth abide. So if you're feeling down and need a smile upon your face, take a stroll to the center of town and drop in at Charlie's place. I'll wander not too far, but stay close to where my loved ones are, so they may see alone they need not fend whatever life may send. Goodbye is always hard to say on the day a friend goes away, but then Distance shouldn't break the ties that friendship make. The path of life will change and bend. Blessed are those who walk it with a friend. As the candle lights the dark until the coming dawn, so lights the lives of many the day a child is born. Well, it looks like we're getting to the end of our little get-together. I hope you enjoyed the poems, and thank you for listening.